So I'm really not having a good week when it comes to these videos. I mean by not having a good week, there are many, many versions of these videos getting recorded. So I wouldn't be surprised if in the end, this video, you see me swatch shirts at least once, if not twice, or multiple times. So today, when I'm currently recording, I'm in a black shirt with Rebel on it. Technically Rebel without a clause. So old Crocs at war. How useful to World War One were the old ships brought out of reserve? This is an interesting question. This is a really interesting question because one of the things about World War One is it's really the last major war fought in the traditional naval style. There is a old designation of a ship if it was in ordinary or if it was commissioned. Ordinary were reserve ships. Ships could be launched and put straight into ordinary and never commissioned for years. They could go through refits and have not been commissioned. And then they're needed. We need a second rate. We need a first rate. We need some another dozen third rates. Oh yeah, we've got them. Da -da -da -da. Commission. Put crews on them. That was the traditional methodology. And that ships traditionally served for a long time. A ship could be commissioned like HMS Warrior was. Commissioned. As pretty much the best battleship equivalent of its time. Yes, it's a frigate. Yes, it's called an armoured frigate. It, it, an iron hulled frigate, all sorts of destinations on it, but it's a frigate. But let's be honest, at the time, there aren't any, isn't anything in the world which really wants to fight the warrior. Not in the open seas. There are all sorts of scenarios people come up with for the monitor versus the warrior, which usually involve the warrior getting into enclosed waters and somehow not moving. And then the warrior can, uh, then the monitor can do damage to it. But at open sea, there is nothing in the world that can fight her. In fact, there's nothing that can really fight her for almost a decade or so, other than her sister, when you look at the actual contemporaries. But she's a frigate. So, I suppose the moment that she surpassed as a battleship, she stops being used and gets got rid of. Oh, no. No, then she's turned over to being a cruiser, rated as a cruiser. And she slowly gets different missions. Because whilst her original capabilities no longer hold true as providing the capability you want for being a battleship. Her existing capabilities, her still remaining capabilities, are perfectly fine for other roles. For secondary roles or tertiary roles. For being the presence ship on a distant station. There is a utility going on there. One of the interesting questions I often get asked by students after I start discussing the reserve ships and the mobilization of reserve ships in World War One is people ask me why they aren't they aren't being mass mobilized in World War Two and there are some ships being brought out of reserve in World War Two. There are some there are whole cruisers being um, uh, being crewed by reservist crews. It's there are. There isn't the vast quantity, though, because of the treaty system. And this is really the problem you get. In terms of skewing our opinions on reserves. After World War I, and leading up to World War II, there's the treaty system, which limits the number of reserves. And number of reserve ships you can have. And then after World War II, very soon, the idea of mass nuclear war, of nuclear Armageddon, takes over. And, well, that makes problems for reserves as well. And so, when we start looking back at World War I, people start asking me questions, like it's posed here by Michael66. How useful really were the old ships, you know? What were they doing? Da 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 da. And, there are good things they're doing, and useful things they're doing. 
Shameless book plug. Yes, um, look, I have a tax bill. It's the joy of life of historians. And, um, it's the joy of life for anyone. The only thing, two things are certain in life, death and taxes, and honestly, HRMC, uh, RMC is actually slightly scarier because they will tax you even when you're dead. It's their skill. But leaving that all to one side, the new edition of the book is out. It's... I love them both. I've got to do a video about them at some point, about them being twins. But, um... Yeah. They're good. And thank you to everyone who's bought a copy. Thank you to everyone who's buying a copy. So, this is the point about thinking about reserve ships differently. As I was talking about... We have a very modern approach, or rather a very Cold War framed approach. You see, the treaty system had meant the sheer quantity of reserves and all the ships that had tradition to, tradition, uh, traditionally been around and available, especially to the larger naval powers, were no more. Because, yes, they have certain overage things, and oh yes, we won't count this tonnage in overage and this tonnage, etc., but they count it differently and there's still limitations. So it's got rid of. And then post World War Two we've A been through a war which has seen visible technological revolution of a scale which has never before been seen. And when I say visible technological revolution, if you consider the technological revolutions of World War One and where they take place, they're mostly on the battlefields, far away from the civilian populations. And to say they're to an extent ignored by the political classes is to be nice, really. Um, that's suggesting the political classes ever took attention of anything. But lots of different countries managed to successfully ignore them. World War Two. Pretty much every country in the world, including America, gets bombed. People usually look at me shocked. Hawaii, bombed. Sections of Alaska, bombed. Before anyone gets on me. It's not quite the same scale as some of the bombing in Europe and Japan, but it's fairly, hero uh, fairly, fairly... Um, bombing. And you see V2s and all these uh, the V1s fl flying over London. You see the impacts of them in London, in a centre of politics, in a centre of culture, in a centre of media. You see them. And so people start to get a very interesting idea about war. And the Americans had already, to an extent, been on that route. Although sometimes people's claims about the Americans learning it's better to expend things rather than people in the American Civil War, and that was the defining, creator, defining idea of their armed forces from that point onwards, is a little bit uh, stretching, stretching the reality. They learn the idea. I don't think it really defines their armed forces till, honestly, I would say till the 1950s. Honestly, I, I don't even think in World War Two uh, uh, until uh, in World War Two they've completely got the whole way there. There are some generals and some admirals who certainly are so inclined, but there are others. MacArthur. So leaving that to one side, leaving that to one side. We have this focus after World War II on technology, on the latest and greatest. And then you have this idea creep in that the wars are going to go nuclear very quickly, within days. So on that basis, you've got two things going against reserve ships, because reserve ships are usually your older ships. 
A, your reserve ships will never be able to fight in a modern war because they're just not going to be they're not just not going to be technologically viable for it. They're not going to be able to deal with it. And two, two, they are not going to be able to activate it in time. And what's really interesting is when you look at NATO navies and armies focusing on air forces, all focusing in around this idea and talking about this and building their force around the structure. You then look at the Soviet side of the coin. And you go... You still are make, keeping your type... Your, um... T-34s. You have T-55s. Currently today, Russia is deploying all sorts of... For want of a better, fr a better phrase, battlefield antiques to go and fight. Are they being used as the linchpins of attacks, the armoured thrust of the forces, when they're sending in old T-55s? No, they're not. What are they being used for? Fire support. They have a gun, they're able to carry ammunition, they're able to navigate over a rough train, they are, broadly speaking, able to be worked, and you can find people who can work them because they're very rudimentary systems. Is that a useful role for them? Yes, it is. Can you easily wipe them out with a modern tank? More than likely. More than likely, a modern tank, uh, tank, uh, a modern tank company versus a tank company from of made up comprised up of vehicles which are, let's be honest, bordering on seventy plus years old. Mm, probably can take them out quite quickly. But that's not the reason you have them in the fight. And if they are there, they're still useful as fire support. And it's the same with HMS Warrior. By the end of her career, her active career in the Royal Navy, her active when she was commissioned in the Royal Navy rather than being in an ordinary, she was being used as a cruiser. When she'd been built, she'd been able to fight the greatest battleships at the time. At the end, would they have taken up against a battleship? No. Because that's not a role anymore. Try and keep away from battleships. Go and deal with enemy cruisers. Which is why it gets so interesting when we start talking about the old ships which get involved in World War One. Because some of those old ships, which people are talking about, would you really consider them old if you're talking in age of sail terms? Let's consider the Bramwell class. HMS Rattler is still used in World War One, And the second Bramwell class, pretty much all of them are wandering around. These are ships which are being usefully used for various roles. How oh, the ships are what? 28 years old in the beginning of World War One. Is that really old? At the moment, it certainly doesn't seem like it. We have frigates which have been in service for 30 years. Yes, Britain currently has the joy of, once again, having to work out crew numbers for ships. And the problem of shrinking force structure, meaning you're able to give people less and less of a career, so they are more likely to leave early because they haven't got prospects of promotion and success and advancement because you've only got so many ships in service. And currently, the Royal Navy is in the process of trying to get a t two Type 26s in various processes of crewing up, two Type 31s in various processes of crewing up. In a, a ship, before it's even launched, starts to get a crew these days. They start to get naval personnel being involved, engineers, all those things being involved. And once they start to going for testing, they start to get more and more crew on them. So, currently, you might have heard some news if you're looking in 2024. Britain is January 2024. One of the first things announced. We've got all the commitments going on in the world we haven't known. There's Russia and Ukraine. There's all the stuff going on in the Middle East, in the Red Sea especially, and very and stuff happening in the Caribbean as well. And plans for carrier deployments to the Arctic and, and the Pacific. 
and yet two frigates, one of them 14 months into a refit, are going to be got rid of. Why? Not enough crew. Which is a really interesting scenario, but it's also something which is more of a problem to manage today than it has ever been. Which is what I find really strange, because if you consider, when we're talking about activating these ships, these old ships, and getting some of them to sea in World War One, they are being crewed by reservists. And they don't have the advantages that we have today of having distributed training systems which can work online. They don't have the advantages of all the methodologies we can have for actually giving people experience. You know, onshore training systems, etc. They have some facilities set up, but it's not quite the same. And yes, you could argue that, okay, we don't have the crews for those ships, so they're not useful. Well, can't you put them into ordinary? You don't have the crew to commission a ship. That Why is that a thing which automatically means you get rid of the ship? That's a very strange idea to put forward. If you were refitting the ship and are 14 months into a refit of the ship, hopefully you've done structural tests and know how valuable that ship is, but surely you were refitting that ship with an idea of having it available for a few years. You've sunk money into that ship. Okay, you don't have the crew for it. Well, fine. But you don't need to scrap it or sell it off. A lot of the problems we have when we're looking back at the World War One ships, like this, HMS Protector, a flat iron gunboat. She served in China, in the Boxer Rebellion, in Rabul in 1914, and she's actually used as a lighter again commit and for that role. In 1943, she's taken over by the Americans. With both these sets of ships, we're not talking about massively powerful war-fighting vessels. And yet they're useful in the war. They have various roles. Some of them are used as training ships, some of them are used as escorts, some of them are used as present ships. Hold, keeping the flag raised high in areas where, frankly, you can't afford to drop the flag, but you really don't want to have one of the ships which you actually want to fight a war with there. Most of their crews in wartime are reservists. Or others of interesting nature. And yes, one of the things I often hear is people go, well, these ships are not as technologically advanced as modern ships are. They aren't. But their population they were recruiting from, you can argue, was not as technologically advanced, or rather not as technologically widespread in terms of knowledge. They're probably they're the same level of intelligence. Please don't, when I'm saying this, I'm not saying they're dumb. Okay? I'm not one of those historians. I, I, I do have fun with my colleagues, who, with my colleagues who seem to believe that anyone in the past is not as intelligent as people are now. They're just intelligent. But if you think about it, in this period... Probably most people who had something to do to sea understood some some things about sailing. Understood some things about maybe astral navigation. And would have an idea of how those things might work. These days, talking about advanced weapon systems, which are often advanced computer interfaces with track, pa uh, track balls and all sorts of things you're using to um, control and aim the missiles. Well, if you think about the sheer amount of people we have who play computer games, 
That's quite a large body of people who probably have some experience of using computerized warfare. I directing warfare through a screen. It's not a hundred percent transferable skills. Please note, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that the uh, the case that's often used about reserve vessels today that it would be too complicated, too difficult to run a ship with reservists to that you couldn't have a pool of reservists to do it. I do not I, I think that's to an extent regurgitating a frame of mindset which was grown up in well in the Cold War. The idea that you wouldn't be able to get the ships into service quickly enough. So, and the idea was because the crew wouldn't have enough training, enough experience, you couldn't get the ship into service within the time it would be before the war would go nuclear and everything would be over. And there was ideas of the war would go nuclear within 45 minutes to four to five days. You can understand that. And to an extent, that makes sense. But if we look at the realities of war, the Royal Navy is, reactiva is activating its reserves well before war is actually declared in September 1939 as part of its deterrence package. It's doing the same in 1914. It's done the same historically. When you're looking at a major threat of war, one of the things you can do to try and deter war, to show you're serious as a nation, you're seriously worried about the conflict, and you prefer there not to be conflict, is to show your teeth by activating your reserves. And I can also point to several conflicts where activating the reserves, mobilizing the reserves, has been enough to de-escalate the conflict. Because, oh, they're that serious. Let's go negotiate. And what would those reserve ships do? Probably, a large number of them, would be escorting convoys in parts of the world where, frankly, you don't need the first, you don't need the first rank ships. We're talking about the Cold War again. You're probably going to need escort convoys up the coast of Africa. Long way from the North Atlantic a battleground. But you're probably still going to want to escort those convoys because there could be something sent to deal with them. Do you really want to send your latest and greatest best destroyer or frigate down there? Or would you rather send something which is got a decent gun, carries a decent anti submarine warfare helicopter? Has some form of air defense system and can probably do the job. Might not, but you know it's gonna it's gonna keep the convoy. It's probably gonna be enough to deal with the likely level of threat the convoy is gonna deal with before it gets into the Bay of Biscay Channel area. Yeah, and that is another problem we have when we're talking about building a six hundred ship navy, which comes up quite often. In World War I, the Royal Navy was very rarely below 600 ships. In fact, often, most of the World War I, it's well over 600 ships. And a good proportion of those ships are, re are reserve ships which have been activated. So instead of this idea of, we ha if we're going to build a 600 ship navy, they've got to all be commissioned ships in service. Yeah! No... And that's actually a very good thing to do with new ships. If you think about it, the Royal Navy is a... I keep using the Royal Navy as an example, and that's because I'm most intimately aware of their procedures, but also because they're the right size and technology for me to illustrate this. When you're talking about the Americans and the Arley Burke class, and you're going, with their 73 in service, da-da-da-da-da, it suddenly becomes slightly more differential. And you're sort of going, 73 in service, they've got... Nine on order, ten building, you know, uh, they haven't retired any yet, uh, that sort of thing. That, that's a big number to deal with. But let's say the uh, with the Type 45s, the Royal Navy was originally planning on 12. Then cut that to initial orders of nine, or plan, or the plan was for nine. And then that final batch was cut down from three to two, and then that was cancelled as well. 
And this is one of the reasons why it causes them to become billion pound destroyers, when it's actually the cost of development is spread over six hulls rather than 12 hulls, and the cost of building those six hulls, that makes them billion pounds each, whereas if you'd had that spread over 12 ships, it would be a very different cost per hour so for per, ship, per unit. But leaving that to one side, let's say they did build nine. They could have stuck free in ordinary. I know... There are lots of lots of newspapers would be in outcry. I can imagine every single year. I don't know. Let's go with the Daily Mail as they're a good example of this because they will be outraged at anything uh, every five minutes. I I do enjoy them, but I do they do admit, I I sometimes think their editors are literally looking for the latest thing to be outraged about. And they will be pointing out these ships have not spent any days at sea this year, or only twenty days at sea this year, and. People will be talking, oh yeah, that's a waste of money, da 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 da. But the reality would have been this. When we needed to send ships in for a major refit, okay, you're put into ordinary, you're, you're, we commission out of ordinary, transfer the crew from the ship which is going in a major refit into one of the ships which is kept in ordinary. That's activated. The ship which is a major refit is technically on a list of ordinary, so we've still got six in service. Free and ordinary. So that automatically gives you this viability. Now, you don't have any extra ships from permanent positions. But you do, if you're going to keep those ships in ordinary, they're going to have a small crew, probably about 20 or so personnel aboard. And you're going to have to keep some reservists. Make sure your reservists are trained up to go onto those ships. So they're going to have to do some dockside training. But you can also use them for dockside training of the regulars. And you can shuffle ships through there. And if wartime comes along, then yes, probably when you're activating them, the crew which takes them to sea is going to be a mixture of people drawn from shore positions who've got Type 45 experience, who have been replaced in their roles ashore by reservists, and the core crew who are already aboard there, and reservists rounding out the rest. And that's your mixture taking to sea. And that means in wartime... You, if you've got a major conflict, you can have nine Type 45 destroyers. And you can therefore put far more forward. You will achieve a far higher operating tempo. You're also at a scenario that if a ship goes into refit and is delayed in refit, or a ship is damaged and needs to go into urgent refit out of ordinary, uh, out of normal, you can bring these ships into service... And you can do that without disrupting your ability to have those six ships available. You give yourself options. As a smaller power, as a medium power, with a lot of commitments, but not a lot of, re not, a lot of, not, a lot of <clears throat> not a lot of resources allocated, reserves make sense. As a global maritime power, which is what um, Britain was basically not, I would never call it superpower, because that's something we associate with nuclear weapons. But it was primus into Paris of the global powers for many, many years. One of the reasons it was this was it was able to call upon a huge, huge amount of reserve ships. This includes in World War I a raw sovereign class vessel, HMS Revenge, the last remaining of the raw sovereigns. And remember, I, I treat that a type of battleship, I call them the Royal Sovereign type battleships. Well, she is modified. She has all sorts of options, and she spends quite a lot of World War One actually being called HMS Redoubtable. But she is given torpedo bulges to protect her against torpedoes. She's been used for bombardment missions. And this is her off the Flemish coast in World War One, filling up one of her torpedo bulges, well, one set of torpedo bulges, with water, so she's tilting the ship, making herself go artificially lopsided, to give her a better angle to fire her gun to hit the targets ashore. I know, USS Texas is the most famous ship to do this, do this, but HMS Redoubtable, as she was called at that point, previously HMS Revenge, of the Royal Sovereign class, did this in World War One. Was she not a useful ship? 
Would the Royal Navy have taken her to the Battle of Jutland? No. No, they wouldn't. And at Jutland, good example I also bring up, because I've done a whole video about the building of fleets of Jutland, you find very quickly that the Royal Navy takes a lot of ships. But one of the interesting things is the Germans have to take their Deutschland class with them, which are... As in colloquial sand lexicon tend to be called pre dreadnoughts but in my lexicon are sort of sovereign style battleships, because I don't like their lex as I've said in a video where I explained this last year in the year of technology, I don't like the idea of calling something a pre dreadnought because they had no idea dreadnought was coming. So it's good for us as historians maybe to classify something as pre dreadnought and post dreadnought, you know, dreadnoughts and pre dreadnoughts. And it was something they used as a cachet thing at the time. But when you consider the Lord Nelsons are built at the same time as Dreadnought and actually commissioned afterwards, and they're called semi-Dreadnoughts, and all sorts of things start going around, it's far easier to call them Sovereign-style battleships. And... The Germans have the Deutschen class, which they're last of these battleships, the last designed to be done. They've still got all of them in service. I'll be getting into those in a bit. They have all their battle cruisers, other than, of course, the Goblin, which is currently at this point in the Black Sea, in Jutland, uh, during Jutland, and all their Dreadnought battleships. And they still have less ships than the Royal Navy has Dreadnought battleships at Jutland, let alone including the Royal Navy's battle cruisers. And on top of that, the Royal Navy also has all these other battleships around the world. And the reason it can afford to concentrate all that mass in the Grand Fleet to fight that battle is because it doesn't have other things calling on it. It's able to send those ships around the world. Why does it not have to have a massive squadron sitting off, sitting outside the Dardanelles waiting for the governor to come out? Because it has Lord Nelson and Agamemnon sitting there. Yes, they are sovereign style. So yes, they're sort of semi dreadnoughts they're built they're, they're the old style battleship built at the same time as HMS Dreadnought. But the Goban really doesn't want to fight them. It really doesn't want to fight them. And honestly it's not got much room for manoeuvre in that area. So it tends to come out and go where it thinks they are not. It can be very successful when it does that. But it's doing that to avoid them for a reason. It doesn't want to fight them. And this this is HMS Redoubtable smashing away at German positions on the Flemish coast, along with other ships of her like, being very useful. They're also there, let's be honest, as an extra blocking force, which if necessary can block, uh, uh, can support the channel barrier and hold up the high seas fleet should it try to make a run for the, cha uh, for the channel. Yes, will they win? No. Yes, they are highly likely to get wiped out by the High Seas Fleet in any sort of battle. But they're likely to hold them up long enough that the Grand Fleet can catch up with them. At which point the High Seas Fleet will be damaged. They won't get through scot-free, the barrier and all the ships that will be supporting it. And they'll have to deal with the Grand Fleet storming behind them and now blocking them off from their only escape route. That's why the Germans don't try to go for the Channel Barrier. Because, yes, they can win the fight, but it will cost them, because of ships like this and the newer versions hanging out there, and also HMS Dreadnought sitting there herself, actually, it will cost them, they will win, but it will cost them, and then they'll have to fight another battle against the Grand Fleet, and they won't win that. So that's the thing, really. And then we have HMS Thor, uh, which is often claimed as the oldest ship fighting in the Royal Navy in World War One. Another interesting vessel with an interesting history. There's a whole argument over whether she is the oldest, or whether she's 1890 when she's launched. And then we got Protector, which is 1884. 
and we've got Rattler. But it all depends on what you think is the definition of fighting. What you think the definition of an active war role is. Any, I would argue, any role which frees up a first-rate modern ship to go to the critical theatres is useful. Because, ideally, you don't want to be using those ships for those roles. You want to have something else to go after. And you need something there. This is another problem we've had crop up. The idea that wars are going to be so short, it doesn't matter if you don't have something in other places. But if the war goes on for a long time, and if we consider recent conflicts have shown that wars can still go on for a long time, and will still require your resources for a long time, then suddenly having to abandon those places completely, and not having anything there, is a risk. Because if you're not present, bad things might start happening. And eventually you might be enforced in a situation that something bad is so bad is happening that it's affecting, directly affecting your relationships and maybe your ability to do other things elsewhere. You might even have to pull forces from a critical theatre to go and deal with the problems there. A good example of this happening to the Royal Navy is World War II. They have far less reserves in World War II than they did in World War I to call upon because of the treaty system. And then in World War II, you look at the Royal Navy getting worn down. And there is a reason why the absolute worst point for the Royal Navy is really to the end of 1941, beginning of 1942. And that's because that's when they reached their nadir in terms of ship strength and ship availability. They just haven't got enough to go around. And they've got no reserve they've been able to pull from. They've actually got the reserve personnel. This is a really interesting thing. In World War II, Britain is really lucky. It has a huge pool of reservists it can draw from to crew its ships. It doesn't have the ships for them. Huge pool of reserves. Also in World War II, what else do we have? Well, in World War I, and World War II actually, can this in this one. She was still doing the job till 1960. HMS Unicorn! Yeah! Drill ship! Providing a place in the centre of Glasgow for reservists to go and drill and maintain their skills and be actually inoculated into the Royal Navy. And there's lots of ships like this around that are providing the Royal Navy with educational spaces. This is not war fighting, no. They, some of them were used as AA platforms. Even in World War II, HMS Victory has some anti-aircraft guns and all sorts of other things can be mounted on them. But, more importantly, they are able to be, they are force multipliers. They are providing the Royal Navy with critical space that it doesn't need to manufacture, that it doesn't need to produce, to enable it to be, pre, uh, be in those places to recruit people, to train people, to school people, to provide it with the personnel that it needs to run. That's useful. Ah, the German Navy. The Kaiserlich Marine, the German Navy in Pride World War I, is probably the least prepared for war of any nation's navies in World War I. And that always sounds weird to say, even for me to say, it sounds weird. The only force I can consider which was less prepared for the war it was going to fight was probably the Kriegsmarine in World War II. And that again sounds outrageous to say, but let's think about it. Most of the German submarines that really are important to their submarine campaign aren't in service before the end of 1941, beginning of 1942. In most of the 1939, 1940, 
for a large chunk of 1941, they are either being built, or they haven't even been ordered, <laughs> or they're being tr crews are being transferred, created and trained up, and then they're going through their commissioning process, all these things. And then, of course, their surface raiders, for most of that period, are Scharnhorst and Neisenau and some pa uh, some Panzerchief, the Deutschen class, or the Hippers, and they don't really have enough of those to form a coherent task force, let alone have any logistics or supplies stuck in bases to support them. It's the same for the German Navy in World War One, And there is a reason for this, so please don't the amount of times, whenever I say I, I say this on YouTube, there's always these couple people come and go, you're just German bashing because you're British. No, I'm not. There's a very big problem the German Navy has with funding. They always have to be on a basis of jam tomorrow. Whereas the British, tend, the British government, especially post-World War II, have always been penny smart, pound foolish. But the Germans were always a case of jam tomorrow. Why? Because there's this huge, great big elephant in the room of German defence funding. It's called, they have got land borders with very large armies, so they need to have a very large army. They were basically formed by a very large army, and the large army was what held them together at certain points. So the large army tends to get the funding first. And things which can directly support the large army will get more funding than things which don't support the large army. The large army really didn't care about the wider German Empire. That was the Kaiser's dream. And that's one of the reasons why the navy is called the Kaiserlich Marine. It's the Kaiser's navy. And so... The thing about the German navy is they have a lot of very cool equipment. But they don't have much of it. And they don't have much depth. So that's why the remaining Brandenburg class, and please note, that is the older two Brandenburg class. That's not the Kaiser First Friedrich Wilhelm or the Weisenberg. Those had both become Ottoman ships, had fought at the um, Battle of Lemnos, when, of course, they were famously defeated by pretty much a Greek cruiser, the Georges Avrov. So that shows their capabilities, I always feel. They were the first, the first battleships the Germans really built. So honestly, the fact that they floated and didn't have that, uh, that actually managed to keep moderately stable at sea is a feat. Let's be honest, when you're putting this much machinery, this much stuff into a ship, into a design you have never built before, that's good. There are issues with them, though, from the beginning. And when I say issues, I've done a video about them, I think. I definitely covered a little bit more details about them in the um, in Jutland video, and the... Uh, pre dreadnought series histories, uh, histories. But the Brandenburg class have a theoretical top speed of 16 and a half knots. For the Ottomans, they never, by the time they got them in 1910 ish, when they got them and they got them actually operational, they decided they could never really do more than 8 to 10 knots. Now, you could say it's Ottoman maintenance, you could say it's the difference of operating in a Mediterranean climate versus a North Sea climate. All those things could have an impact, could be their age. But whatever the question, whatever the reality is, by 1914, these ships were not good. Now, immediately, that doesn't cause a problem. The Royal Navy is using a sovereign class, uh, uh, the sovereign class, Alex. You know, it's it's fine. They're using a sovereign class. Uh, you know, using a couple of these, it's, that's surely fine. Well, how do I put this politely? The thing is, the Royal Navy starts off using them as bombardment ships, and that's what they're using their older, older ships, sovereign starships, for. The Germans start off with these being part of 5th Battle Squadron. 
defending the German coast in case of British attacks. Well, here's the problem. Even if they can do 16 and a half knots, if you've got them to deal with the smaller things, they're not going to catch them. That could count the British could send to attack. If you've got them dealing with the larger things, they're not going to catch them if the British send them to attack. In fact, I don't think there's really anything in the British arsenal that the British would have sent to attack Germany that these could have actually caught up with. And whilst we're talking about intercepting missiles, we're often talking about something... Basically, you work out that's cut, you detect it at long range of radar, it's coming in, you're aiming to come up, and that's the point of intercept. And you usually calculate it long before you launch this, your interceptor missile. You're watching for this missile at, you know, a lot, as long a range as you can. You can't really do that in World War One with ships. Yeah, I suppose theoretically Zeppelins could spot them. But the thing is, you come into visual range. Long before you probably come into firing range, and practical firing range... And, as I said, there is nothing the British would be attacking with that could not outrun them. And when I say outrun them, I mean outrun them by a significant margin. Um, HMS Dreadnought. 21 knots, definitely. Versus 16.5, theoretically, possibly... Let's say they the fir the oldest two, Brandenburg and Werf, were actually slightly better than the youngest two, and it was the Mediterranean to an effect uh, to an extent affecting their condensers and systems, and so they could keep things up. Probably you're looking at 1914, 12 to 13 knots, really being their top speed. That's not going to work. Don't get me started on destroyers. So why are you using them? Why are you sending up? I'm honestly not surprised that during the war they are then assigned to coast uh, to bombard missions in the Baltic. Okay, that makes sense at that point. But they use useful against Russian forces. But then there's a shortage of transport because again the Kaiserlich Marine wants to do something with the army. They wanted it, but they don't actually have the funds to actually have the organ the things in place to do it. And then they have crew shortages. Again, why do they have crew shortages? Because they don't have the reserves. If you think about where does Britain get its reserves from, Britain used to have a lot of reserves. It now has a lot less reserves because of con the constant... I would say you've had an undermining from two, three different directions for reserve formations. And you've got... It's basically undermined the traditional groups that produce the reserves. The traditional organized forms that the reserves come from are from the merchant marine which is small as ever been from people who want to serve but don't want to be a regular that used to be quite a large chunk of the Royal Navy volunteer reserve etc used to be a huge number of them um, you lawyers etc people who well they want. They like the navy. They like the idea of maybe they like the idea of an extra paycheck. There are lots of potential reasons, but maybe they just enjoy it as a reason for actually getting out and doing something different from their lives. But they don't want to do it as a full time career. They have families or other commitments, or honestly, they enjoy their job, but they want to be able to do something more. I don't agree with the whole line you sometimes hear that you're twice a citizen or something when you're a reservist. And you have a civilian occupation. You're not. You're, you're still just a citizen. Just, just, yeah. That's that. That sounds to me like overegging the flannel. And um, the other group, of course, are regulars. And the Royal Navy used to have quite a lot of these regulars who, once they left service, would go into the reserves. And that used to be informally for the Royal Navy, especially prior to World War One, but. In uh, in the 1920s and 30s, well, to explain a methodology of keeping track of people when they went into civilian life and making sure they were okay. It's one of those things that we now have a lot of formal systems to replace what used to be an almost acknowledged informal system. 
whereby it's known that some people need the structure in their lives, but they can't go on anymore in the armed forces. Maybe they're injured, maybe all sorts of things that they don't want them in regular service. But you can maybe use them in the structure or something in the reserves. And so they still have some of that structure. They still have some of that status, some of that group in the, uh, that they can belong to. So they don't lose everything. If they want to, of course. And the Royal Navy used to, for all this, had huge numbers of reserves to call upon. But, but, in contrast, the Germans, the Kaiserlich Marine, again, has to deal with the elephant in the room, that is the German army. And they need more reserves, far more reserves, because look at all the borders they've got to defend. And the trouble is, especially as things start to go towards motorization, mechanization, you're competing for the same people. The one thing the Royal Navy has as their glorious advantage versus the British Army in the run-up to World War One is the British Army are being as <laughs> technophobic as they traditionally can be. I Don't get me wrong, there are sections of the Army, the engineers, the artillery, which, the intelligence corps, which are always very good. Even the loggies, the logistics regiment, or the really large corps, let's see some people call it, they are always fairly technically minded. But the British Army as a whole has a history of going through phases which turn up quite regularly of becoming incredibly technophobic. And luckily for the Royal Navy, in terms of getting hold of the skilled people you need for, for engineering, for the things on board ships, they were going through that phase in about 1905 to 1913. <laughs> Didn't help the British Army, but it helped the Royal Navy. And so, again, for the Germans, this causes trouble. Because if you want to use the older ships, and they're using older ships. They have to use older ships. They don't have enough numbers. They don't have the... The British are using their ships to free up their new uh, their capacity of modern ships. The Germans are using their older ships to make up for the fact they don't have enough ships. Plural, uh, just plainly, they don't have enough ships. It's plain and simple. If I return, I refer you to an earlier something that I've pointed out about Jutland. If you go and look at the Battle of Jutland video and you go and look at it, you'll uh, see very clearly. I go through the numbers. And not only are the Germans not building enough cruisers, and they're not really building the biggest, uh, bigger destroyers, because they have to make sacrifices somewhere to be able to afford to build the dreadnoughts. They're not able to build enough dreadnoughts, really. And that's why, when we start talking about the numbers of ships at the Battle of Jutland, the Germans have a class of the, have the Deutschen class there. Which are lovely ships. The Deutschen class are lovely ships. But they are most definitely not dreadnought level battleships. Not sure if I would call them full sovereign star battleships. But they are capable of a top speed of 19 knots. They have four 11 inch guns. And honestly... They are Lord Nelson class equivalents at best. That's what you probably sort of putting them. I think about putting them up against. Whereas the Lord Nelsons at this point, they're sitting for the British while the Germans going on in the Mediterranean, being used to keep the Goban scared. They can scare a battle cruiser. That's the thing. The Deutschen class can scare a battle cruiser because they've got the armor. And they can fight if it gets within their range. But the whole point about a battle cruiser is it's usually fast enough to keep out of their range. Unless you're the Goban, in which case you try and avoid the British uh, British ships because you know if you've got a narrow enough space in the Mediterranean and Dardanelles area that if they manage to catch you, if even one of them catches you, the other one might catch you. And the British so basically spend quite a lot of the time with... Lord Nelson here and Agamemnon here, and basically the idea is if the Goban comes out, 
then one tries to catch it while the other one tries to block its escape. That's their plan. It never works out that way, but they're always trying that. So for the Germans, everything is being run through on a minimal budget. They are trying to take on a global maritime power with an economy which is dependent upon the sea lines of communication for importing several very crucial and vital resources. And they haven't managed to have the strength build up because they haven't got the reserves to mobilize that strength, even if they had it, had it, and they haven't got the wider forces, they haven't had the infrastructure, the maritime industry and the investment to build up enough ships to directly challenge it. But they try. And their ships... The Brandenburg class mostly are useful in World War One For the Ottomans, they're fairly useful. In terms of Brandenburg and Werf, eventually Werf's guns are turned into railway guns. And Brandenburg's guns were supposed to go to the Ottomans to help them support their ships. And they don't. We're fairly certain they don't. But they're not even the oldest ships. That's just the thing. These were the Irene class was still considered vital cruisers, pretty much up until World War One starting is coming, and then they're going, okay, we can't crew these ships and crew the other ships we want to crew, and do we really want to send these to war? They don't, but they convert them to a submarine tender. The Irene gets converted to a submarine tender, does a good job, and a naval mine storage hulk. Useful. Both useful uses of them. And let's be honest, you're happy to store mines aboard a ship sitting out in the bay somewhere, or out in the harbour somewhere, away from everything vital. It does make life a little bit safer, a little bit easier, a little bit more secure. And there's nothing wrong with using ships like that. They're not the oldest ships. No, 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 no. The older ships which actually end up in battle are the Austrian ships. Yes, the Austrian Navy. No I didn't put them as being less prepared for war than they should have been. Actually, if you consider the Austrian Navy, whilst they have got extensive building plans, they are pretty prepared for the war they think they're going to fight. They have a fairly decent number of submarines, etc. They're not the largest navy by any stretch of the imagination, but being the largest navy doesn't mean, mean you're going to be the most prepared navy. There's an also an interesting question as whether the Royal Navy is the most prepared Navy for World War One. I. I would argue it was quite well prepared, but I don't think it was the most well prepared for World War One. For what its own mission is. Conversely, sometimes the debate for me of which is the most prepared for what its missions are is between the Austrian and the Italian Navy. Because they've been building well-rounded navies, mostly the idea of beating the other up. Yes, the Italians were technically the Austrians and Germans' allies, but the Italian never get let never get a, a piece of, let a piece of paper get between the fact that you actually hate each other. Please don't let a piece of paper get between that. That just that just ruins the entire emotions of national international relations. It's just terrible. So the Lefer and Moros. Yes, these are monitors. Yes, they are built to the same pattern and design of turret as was pretty much fitted on the USS Monitor. And yes, they did fight in World War One, Multiple times. They did all sorts of fun things in World War One. At the beginning of the war, Leifer was just about to be demobilized. However, they decided, actually no, we won't demobilize them. We'll send both of them. We'll send both of them up the river. And soon they were in action on the Sava. You know, uh, the first Hungarian war hero of the Austro-Hungarian Navy, the sailor Janos Hü, served the border Lefer and was killed in the battles of the 12th of August, 1914. Her greatest damage occurred in October 1914 during the first occupation of Belgrade. And, well, that was the turret suffered a direct hit and it killed the crew inside she then is repaired and she's back at uh, she's back on the river again 
1915, she gets a Skoda 66mm L42 gun. It's helpful. It's nice to have an extra weapon. Uh, she has a pair of 37mm Hotchkiss revolver cannon. And a pair of 8mm Charles Laws machine guns. All replacements for the uh, guns installed in 1892. She also, above the Skoda 66mm, the L42. That means 42 cal. So it's basically its length of the uh, length of the barrel is 42 times its diameter. It has another gun, which is an L18. So it's 66 mils times 18 for its length of its barrel. So very much shorter range, and the guns are located one on top of the other. She became flagship of the Danube Flotilla and participated in the second occupation of Belgrade. And she's in action against the Romanian troops when they are crossing the Danube. And supported the Austrian and German forces crossing the Danube at Schwistov. She has an active World War One, And she even fights against the short very short existing Soviet Republic in Hungary in 1919 and well she fought against the Czech interventionist troops and she did all sorts of things she just she just never got stops being used at certain points eventually she is going to let go of and the reason she survives this today is because she was actually sold to a Swiss company who used her for various jobs. But eventually, they found her, and she is used, and now is, a museum ship. And you can go and have a look around her. And she's a legacy of a world at war which she actually survived. Apparently it's opposite the parliament. Worthwhile going to see, I think. Worthwhile going to see. And she's also at the Parliament in Budapest. Then we have the French Navy. Now we have to go for... Probably one of the contenders of least well prepared for any war. The French Navy. Uh, the French Navy have a long history of being very innovative. The French Navy have a long history of having... A maritime industry which takes absolutely no notice of them when they order a construction. Um, I, I love the French Navy has a great idea, and then they send it out to their industry, and the industry will put their own take on it. And it's one of the problems they constantly have is due to the various political scenarios they are dealing with. They can never really restrain them in. They neither can they concentrate construction solely with one. So, whilst they're still dealing with the joys of that constructor's um, <clears throat> interpretation of the plans, they can focus it or they will only get one interpretation of the plan, so therefore they get a class which is broadly similar. But neither do they ever have the political support from their governments that they can enforce a strong standardization. And then you, of course, have the fact that once they get over their flirtation with the uh, Junecol, and they really start down the road of actually building some actual decent battleships, they've got a whole host of hotels in service. I'd argue the Marsu class ironclads are certainly amongst their number. Marceau's converted to a floating workshop to support torpedo boats and submarines. The remainder of the class, the remainder of the class, thankfully, are, um, how do I put this politely? Well, Neptune was stricken in 1908, and Magenta was stricken in 1909. 
What I would say about Marceau is that using as her as such was not exactly a bad idea. She has a lot of space. She's quite an easy to convert hull. In fact, as an ironclad, she's probably easier to convert than some of the vessels which have Harvey or even Krupp armor on. Because let's be honest, the ironclad armor is easier to remove often. As time went on, not only did the armor improve, but the methods of attaching the armor and integ integrating armor and armor in various places into ships changed and improved and evolved to give them a stronger, stronger position. So actually, some of the earlier ships are actually easier to convert into workshop space. And for the French, again, this matters. If you consider where they are wanting to operate their squadrons, where they are operating to operate their forces, they often have a problem of infrastructure to support those bases. So having vessels they can convert into basically mobile infrastructure, that makes a difference. It's critical for the Royal Navy in, a run in World War I and World War II. It's critical for the French Navy. It's critical for pretty much every Navy. When you're looking at realistic global operations, the odds are you're going to end up operating from places which have either been... How do I want to put this? If I'm going to put this in a clinical phraseology, uh, phraseology frame, uh, framing, which is often used to describe these things, so please note that's what I'm referring to. Have been downgraded or degraded, depending on who you're talking to, by enemy action. Or never had anything to degrade or downgrade in the first place because they hadn't had the infrastructure built up. And you have a choice. You turn up, you build something there, how long are you going to be using it for? How much stuff are you going to put there? And then if you, lo if you lose it or lose access to it because it's in someone else's territory or someone else gains control of it, you've lost all that you've invested. Whereas if you have a ship which is modified to be a floating workshop to support torpedo boats and submarines, and let's be honest, she'd spent the years from 1912 to 1914 primarily involved in the training of torpedo crews and being used as a training vessel on many occasions. So she has that advantage. And as a workshop, as a mobile workshop, she can be put where you need her to be. She can support those vessels and those units. And that gives you a lot of fighting capability because if you don't have this vessel, you either have to build the facilities, secure those facilities, and be sure you're going to have access to those facilities there, and then you might, if you then change your operations, you have to do the process all over again. You won't get access to those really good war fighting vessels if you don't have something to support them and keep them in commission, because nothing loses its ability to operate faster than a military or naval equipment being deployed in war. Mainly because everything is out to get you. At sea, the sea is always out to get you. It is always out to get you. And salt water is a never-ending corrosion degradation operation. It is... It, you are never going to win that battle. You're always fighting a delaying action, never a winning action against the salt water. Okay, it's always the laying action. You are buying yourself time for it degrades to the point at which it's not usable. You are not stopping it. And the smaller the vessel, the newer the vessel, the more innovative the vessel, the more it has bits which can go wrong. The more it has bits which are custom bits, which if you don't have a heavy duty workshop yourself, which can probably fabricate those parts for you, and then fit them to the ship, preferably, you're going to be in trouble. You're going to be not able to maintain operations, because it's going to be ages before you get those parts. Especially, this is the joy of the French Navy. Because... <laughs> trying to get the different yards to standardise across each other. It's... It's those things. The French always have such great ideas. They really do. 
If you want some really interesting ideas in naval architecture and design, they have them. The Juno Coal is not the smartest strategic idea ever had by anyone, but some of the ideas behind making vessels work in it is, are really good. That's why they're nicked wholesale by other nations. It's just the French then take those ideas and they give them to what I can only say are a bunch of experimental physicists. And I have a reason for using experimental physicists. I love them. I work with experimental physicists on a regular basis. One of my ex-girlfriends was an experimental phys is an experimental phys physicist um, a long time ago. Well, we dated a long time ago. She's now married and has kids, but yeah. They have never disappointed me in their ability to take any idea that's come up by the theorists, any thing, and design a test to both design something to both test that idea, test that theory, and try and prove or disprove it, but also to make it better. And they are never stop thinking of these things to make it better. They are a constant fountain of this this energy, this these ideas. And they are brilliant people if you want to do that, if you want to test the ideas, if you want to push the envelope. If you want to build a fleet, you don't want experimental physicists being in charge of your yards. Or rather, that kind of energy being the energy your yards have. Especially not when you're developing things like torpedo boats, things like submarines. And then you have to support them in operations, and you go, So, our torpedo boats, we've got 12 from this yard. Yes. And how many different types of engine transmission do we have going on here? Well, they had a great idea after boat number two. Okay, so that's two types. They had another great idea after boat number three. Okay, we're on to three types then. And they had a really cool idea after boat number five. That's four types of transmission. How many of these boats do we have? Six. And the thing is, you get the really cutting edge, really cool equipment, but sustaining it in operations is a freaking nightmare. It's either it, it's either they have that sort of energy going on their yards. Or, alternatively, the other option is that the admirals of the French Navy hated their logisticians. Hated them with a passion. Just wanted to torture them. And their engineers as well. It's one of those things. But, the point I'm making is, yeah, this ship is not a warship in World War One, But it's still frigging useful. Without it, you wouldn't have a lot of the capabilities the French rely on in the Mediterranean. And then we have the Piemonte. Which actually, okay, it serves as part of the second fleet of the Regia Marina, which was actually supposed to be an it was actually an active formation. They're all their previous generation of ships, pretty much. San Giorgio's, all those good ships. Even if the San Giorgio's did have ten-inch guns, they were still good ships, and they're practically a dreadnought-shaped uh, design. This could not be more a traditional late 19th century cruiser design if it tried. It literally looks exactly like every, almost every other nation's one. You can take up that outline and put it over some of the early, some, town, some of the predecessors of town class, etc., and those things, and you would have a fit. And yet, she's part of their force. Why? Because. The Italians have been looking at the Austrians and gone, our advantage is we can we build more, we have more of an infrastructure, and we can have more reserves. And because we have sea on three sides versus land mountains on the northern side, the navy can actually fight on an even ground with the army for funding. And so the navy actually gets funding. And so they're part of the Italian mass. Which is one of the reasons why the Austrians, despite being prepared in many ways for fighting the war, aren't able to really break out of the Adriatic. Because the thing is, if they come up against the main fleet 
of the Italian force, they're matched against equals. They come against the second fleet, they're going to probably win the fight, but then they're going to have to fight the main fleet. And if they fight the main fleet, they might win. It's going to be equals, but they might win. But then they're going to have to fight the second fleet. It makes pushing through that barrier a task which you cannot accomplish. Because either you end up fighting this fleet, winning, but getting some damage and some issues because they're not going to go quietly into the night. They're going to fight hard. Again, one of the really weird things from history is we have all sorts of jokes about the Italian Navy being cowards and these things. They're not. They are a very aggressive, very professional fighting force. They have political issues in World War II with their senior leadership, but the actual ships themselves will fight hard. They're often for, or find themselves fighting the Royal Navy who also fight hard and it's a interesting battle, you know, things like Battle of Cape Bon, etc. But also there's the battles of certain. There's all sorts of operations where it goes backwards and forwards. So they're a really good, really capable Navy. Part of the reason is that they are mainly able to build up this level of experience in World War One, And then they don't suffer the issues the Germans have because they don't have the Treaty of Versailles. They don't have those scenarios. They're part of the Washington and London Naval Treaty Series, which cause their own issues. But, you know, they don't get the Francisco Caracolas. But they have a good fleet. And so, yes, this ship from 1889 is a frontline warship in World War I. Actually looking at fight and being used to fight the enemy. Actively being looked at to, you, to fight the enemy. I'm glad it wasn't used to actively fight the battle against the Austrians, because I think against the forces in the Second Fleet, I think they would have taken them out. I, I don't really have any doubts about that. The Second Fleet was the uh, Regia Margarita class, the Regina Elena, um, the Pisa uh, class, the San Giorgio class, so it's about five armoured cruisers, it's three Sovereign-style battleships, or pre-dreadnoughts, as they're more commonly called, but I don't like that because pre-dreadnought means, it means you know dreadnought's coming. No one would build a pre-dreadnought if they knew dreadnought was coming. Especially not the Italians, who are actually have the ideas if you go into... The Dreadnought videos, you'll know the Ita on this channel, the Italians had the ideas for Dreadnought earlier. And, you know, they were there to support mass boats, the torpedo boats, they were there, you know, they were part of this fleet, which was there at base of Brinsey to support the blockade of the Austrian Hungarian Navy. None of these ships are great, and as yeah, my, my fear, my thinking strongly is that if they actually bumped into the Austrian fleet with the Tekatovs at the front, the Tekatovs would take them out. But they would damage something on their way got out. They wouldn't go quietly into the night. And that's going to put the Austrians at a disadvantage when the main fleet turns up. Good ships, though. So, yeah, World War I was a reserve mobilization war in many, many ways. Yes, there's mass and a mass production war and a mass mobilization war, but it's a reserve mobilization war, especially for the first chunk of it. And from this is mainly from a naval perspective. World War II was a mass production war, which tried to buy time to implement that with reserve mobilization. But they had far limited resources to mobilize. They had far limited strength to mobilize. And one of the interesting things was, in this period, you had the RNR, RNVR, and they have their own distinct, which I kind of liked, distinct markings. So you could tell what an officer was, what a sailor was, from, from their markings. You could tell if they're reserved, they're volunteer reserve, or they're regular. Now, these days, this is mostly gone. 
and most navies have sort of got rid of it. The idea being, well, you know, we should treat them all as the same. And I can understand that. But I think there's also an issue with that, from my perspective, similar to the problem with the Germans getting rid of the names for their destroyers and vessels below that in World War II after Narvik, so, so they can avoid the psychological loss of ships with names. Yes, you're making everyone feel, feel part of the na one navy, but you're also taking apart, taking away one other f extra thing which adds to the esprit de corps of the reserves. Because it was a way to differentiate themselves in a way. So it works both ways. You've made them feel, you can say you've made, done it to make them feel more a part of the Navy. True. And that will have instantaneous morale effects. But it also means that when you're talking about operations, when you're showing a video of people on, I don't know, on operations, I'll be honest, it's, you can't easily tell them apart from the rest. And that kind of helps, if you can, because it's kind of advertises, oh look, there's a reservist doing that, there's a reservist. And even if people don't know what the differential between the two means, different shapings means, if they're interested, they'll look it up. And then they might look up the reserves and might decide to join. It's just a fact. Reserve ships require reserve personnel to be of use, to be of value. You need to be able to draw on a strength, a wider, larger strength than that which you maintain in peacetime. Because the realistic rule of thumb is, for however many ships you need in peacetime, you need twice to three times as many in wartime. The reason you need that is because you probably still need to do many of your peacetime functions whilst carrying out and mobilizing a fleet to fight a war. Good example we have going on in the world at the moment. We have lots and lots of issues going on around the world, and often the first response from people is, where is the nearest aircraft carrier? Have the US Navy sent, uh, has the US Navy dispatched an aircraft carrier? Where is this? Where is that? There are a finite number of ships available. And it becomes a question of, where do we take ships from? Where can we afford not to have ships? And if you don't have ships for too long in that area, you can have problems turn up in that area. You could argue some of the problems we're experiencing at the moment could be because of ships being absent quite long term from certain areas in numbers because they've been focusing on other critical areas. It's far worse in wartime when you have to put together whole fleets where it's not individual extra warship patrols or uh, moving a battle group from one place to another it's actually moving entire fleets to go and fight things and do things and then these old ships come into their own they are either providing the presence filling in the gap for those ships which have had to go to military operations they are being converted to mobile stores and workshops which can sustain that fleet on its operations. Sometimes they're being used as training establishments. They all have value. They all have purpose because if you don't have them, you can't mobilize the fleet you need to. So, I hope that answered the question. I hope that was interesting to you all. Um... Usually I come up with a question at this point. And, well, two things. One, if you go to the beginnings of naval aviation uh, video, which came out on Tuesday the 3rd of January 2024, you'll see I've asked for suggestions for the 2024 year of the aircraft carrier. There are 22 open sort of boxes. I'm sort of asking for suggestions. I have to admit, some of the suggestions have come in very personally via WhatsApp. Um, and I've suggested videos which I think you will very much like from people who've gone, I'd like to collaborate on X, Y, or Z. Do you fancy doing the video? Yes, 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 we'll do that. So that's going to be fun. And I'm still looking at all through all your suggestions. So that's, that's fun. Any more to come in is going to be great. 
But today's actual question for this video If you were going to try and rebuild a reserve or a, res a reserve force or ordinary force for pick any nation, pick your own, pick other nations, I don't mind. How would you go about it? Because there's no real navy in the world which currently has an actual warship reserve or ships in ordinary, not in the volume necess uh, necessary to really constitute a reserve. So pick any navy, any modern navy. Look at the lessons, look at the mobilizations from World War One. look at the forces used, and sort of, I'd like you to think through and see what you think. And remember, it's not necessarily about providing forces or building brand new ships. Or providing forces for the battle line or the first fleet operations. And this is something that often comes into the debates I've mentioned the cold, especially post Cold War, is people going, What about hypersonics? Can that ship defend against hypersonics? And you sort of think, well Where is it going to be operating in the world? Is it likely to be facing that kind of threat? Does it therefore need that? I think you have to be more honest about ships if you have them. You have to be honest, well, these are our war fighting vessels. These are our not war fighting vessels. I'd argue the Royal Navy actually almost got itself into trouble that because it basically admitted it had five Type 23s, which were of its 13 Type 23s, which were general purpose frigates and were for the presence mission and for constabulary duties and maybe task group duties, i.e., as an extra vessel in the task group to provide an extra hangar and flight deck for a Merlin anti submarine warfare helicopter to provide extra Seawolf missiles and an extra four and a half inch gun to do some bombardment if necessary. But it really it didn't have a towed array, it didn't have a lot of the upgrades which went into the eight vessels which did. That didn't mean they weren't useful. It meant you were freeing up the scenario so you weren't using those eight vessels up doing those missions. But it still wasn't a reserve. And I think that's where we're getting ourselves into trouble. But I'd like to hear what your suggestions are. I'd like to hear your ideas of how to constitute a modern reserve. And with that, I'm going to leave you with this to look at for a few minutes and see what's coming up in the year of the aircraft carrier. And to maybe have some ideas, please go over to the beginnings of naval aviation. And I'm going to be publishing the full up version of this next week. Next Tuesday, probably. Thank you very much for watching.